Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Chain Reaction Tales from the Supply Chain. With us today, I have Mr. Shannon Breen. He is the co founder of Freight Waves based in Arizona. Freight Looking, oh, edit. <laughs> Start over, Jeff. Yeah, you're too you early. An, to in all fairness, you had an article of freight waves on your LinkedIn. So I did. Hey, it was stuck mind. on your brain. I'm like, hey, I'm, we're only 10 seconds in. We could definitely start over. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna discount some of my mis, misnomer there. It didn't just come out of the oh, and it's Vana too, because people some people say Vana. Don't do that. I figured Vana, like because there's yeah, Carvana, because hey. there's Carvana. There's Tivana too. So let's let's give credit to Tivana, who was much earlier than all of okay. us. Well, yeah. fair enough. So Let, uh, let's not talk about that either. There's some sensitivities. So <laughs> <laughs> so uh welcome everybody to Chain Reaction Tales from the Supply Chain Front Lines. I am Jeff Davis, and with us today we have Mr. Shannon Breen, the co-founder of Freight Vana based in Arizona, uh, definitely looking to hear what he has to say about various aspects of the logistics market. Shannon, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got here. Uh, well, uh, grew up without any background experience in transportation. Um, had entrepreneurial spirits when I was younger, Jeff, always was that kid in, in high school. I, I pictured myself having franchises and 30 or 40 and X number of franchises by a certain age. That didn't pan out. Uh, backgrounds in finance, so spent a lot of time on that in school. Uh, ended up doing working for a private equity company and some sister companies doing some work. Uh, then 2012 came and really was my first foray into transportation. So uh, I've lived here in the Phoenix Valley for 30 plus years. It's been home college here, uh, joined the ranks of, of night Swift, Swift transportation, really night at that time, uh, out of Phoenix, right? Pre-merger and worked my way up through the ranks and really enjoyed the business and the chaos and the people. Uh, and I just fell in love with it. So it, it really spoke to me. I love, love solving the problems, love working with some of the tech stacks and packages and have been doing transportation logistics ever since 2012. So uh, over a decade uh, in the industry and uh, excited to see what we and honestly the industry does next because there's so much out there and uh, big ocean as we all talk about but a lot of opportunities for for, for folks uh, hopefully like ourselves yeah uh, absolutely and, and so there's a few things there I want to hit on right so you're are, you are an entrepreneur at heart from from early on yeah I would say so yeah yeah and you started out in what you said, private equity? I was working for a private equity company doing some more finance side, right? Doing financial planning and analysis. Yeah. Um, I think from a career standpoint, Jeff, there's, uh, you may have experienced this yourself, but there's sometimes when you can do something and then there's sometimes when you love doing the things that you're doing. And I think yeah. that there's a, there's a chasm there. And so uh, while I could do uh, financial planning and analysis, that that was not my true calling. And it, it, it left me uh, wanting more uh, in different areas of my life. And so when I found myself to transportation, I felt like it was a perfect fit. Yeah. Do any of those skills kind of translate in from, from your finance days into what you're doing now? Absolutely. I think from a business perspective, right? Understanding the bottom line, understanding the costing, tax implications, um, understanding how the balance sheets and P&Ls work and being able to manage a business from the backside um, had really, really suited me well, to your point, uh, yeah. in my career uh, working for uh, a publicly traded transportation company. And honestly, even out on, on our own today, it, it, it suits me well. So those, those skills do translate quite well. I'm going to change gears. So you came in in 2012. What was, and I don't know if you remember, but what was like the big technology kind of advancement going forward then? Yeah, a, a lot of talk about TMSs then, Jeff, right? Oh, so you yeah. had you had big industry players that had for for really had kind of cornered the market, I'd say, on two fronts. So I love the question. Two fronts that I I'd say they had the market cornered for the big establishments were their TMS, customized TMS solutions that they had built, mm -hmm. and the data analytics that they housed within it. And so an interesting as 2012, 2012 moved on, you saw a lot more participants 
building um, out of the box technologies that you could buy off the shelf. You saw the advancement of third party uh, integrators and data sources that could provide better intelligence to the industry, even if you didn't have the volumes of the biggest and baddest players in the industry. And so at that time, it was it was it worked really well because I was working for an institution that also needed advancements in the platforms we were using and what we we're going to do with the data and how do we capture it. So um, that was an interesting time in transportation. I got a really good uh, chance to work through some projects that allowed me to be right at the crux of some of that. But I think at that point in time, that was a huge conversation and where a lot of the industry was wondering, like, hey, do we buy versus build, buy versus build? Conversation still happens today. There are so many participants on the data and TMS side of the business uh, than 10 years ago. It, it's wild to see how different it is. Yeah. Data is more valuable than gold, right? And yeah. more valuable than oil, right? It's it's yeah. the most valuable commodity. And yeah, so I remember TMS coming out and that was the big solution set. Who were they? Who was the two big TMS? I don't remember. Who well, I mean, look, you got big outfits, right? I think you've got like a CH Robinson clearly, right? Been doing this for 120 years. So yeah. they dominated on both data and their platform. Okay. They were yeah. obviously a, a, a leader and, and still are today. Um, you've had other other big institutions like an Echo Global uh, Logistics and some others. So they really had some distinct advantages of size and still do. But I would say kind of like a race, I feel like the rest of the market kind of caught up to them in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not being able to replicate clearly size and breadth and, and all the experience they had. But in regards to data analytics and functionality of the TMS, many people started to close the gaps and continue to do so. Um, even some would argue surpassed that um, functionality that some of those industry leaders had the advantage 10 years ago. So fast forward, 2023, what's happening in technology in our industry now? Well, I think it's a really interesting time. Um, in order to understand where we're at or where I maybe perceive us at today, you got to go back a few years, right? Everybody's selling the best whiz bang technology that's going to <laughs> democratize freight, remove all humans, um, and be the next thing that the entire fragmented industry of, of trucking transportation goes to. Yeah. That would have been kind of the, the headline story from 16 to 17, definitely into 18, 19, and 20. Um, but I think 23 is an interesting story because we're seeing uh, some of those stories start to erode. We're seeing uh, the plausibility of some of those marketing packets uh, start to kind of fall apart underneath the weight of the market, underweight the weight of uh, fundament financial fundamentals. And so this, to understand 23, think you, how did we get here? Well, a lot of money pouring into the space, a lot of popularity on transportation, especially following uh, COVID and some of the disruption. Okay, well, what solutions really work? What platforms really built to be sustainable? What platform actually can produce profits and maintain their employee base and have scale? And so very interesting time as we go through these challenging transportation and economic times to see kind of, hey, we'll, what, what, who are the strong ones that will, will survive? So that's kind of the theme and status, or at least as I see it in, in the market that we're in today. Yeah, it's interesting that you... So, so what you're saying is, you know, there was all this marketing, this, this push to uh, drive out manual processes, optimize, mm -hmm. automate. And I guess in the last year, last 12 months and 18 months, if I'm hearing you right, some of that actually happened because the labor force was reduced. So it's a matter of, are we going to, or what lasted, what actually worked? So some of these got put to the test. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think our, our continue to be tested, which is, which is evolution, right? I think yeah, yeah. These, these ideas come about and people try them and they market them, they get money behind them. And then what really sticks, what really works? Yeah. What is that intersection of old school, new school? What will prevail? Um, and what business models can sustain that, right? Especially as the capital markets dry up, it's a real test, right? Because if you can't pick up the phone and raise X dollars, 
and someone's like, hey, you've got to right size this business to either make money, stop bleeding money. That's a wholly different problem that some people are now being forced to solve here in the last six to nine months. And I think we'll continue to have to solve for the next nine to 12 months uh, in our space, surely. So, yeah. And, and I foresee the nine to 12 month challenge as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, man, I had like a LinkedIn conversation with somebody kind of in the tech space about this very thing of, you know, we, we live, we work in a manual industry where you, guys on in the warehouse are unloading trucks and loading trucks and palletizing and, and deconsolidating. And a lot of the stuff we actually enter in manually, but some of that has been optimized. So to what extent will AI and machine learning help? And his input was there's already been tremendous progress. And, you know, if a, if a bill of lading can be cut by EDI, then you just remove that whole, you just remove this and you don't need it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much more to be had. And I think, uh, you know, as you cut, continue, the industry continues to cut through the noise. Participants continue to make bets with their wallets on what tech works and what doesn't. It's going to be a really cool time to um, continue that evolution, right? And it's happening at a fast rate. Um, this will be a tough time, but I think there'll be a lot of winners coming out of the backside of it. Yeah. So, you know, what 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 is the industry kind of customer segment that you work in? Yeah, so full truckload uh, for start. A lot of people ask us about LTL and, you know, there's some stuff on our roadmap, but full truckload, uh, transportation and logistics, um, dry and refrigerated primarily. We don't, we don't do a lot of bulk. We do a minimal amount of flatbed, but, but an area that we can cover off on. So I say dry and reefer. Uh, what makes us very interesting, Jeff, is we've got our own unique trailer pool, uh, which helps us to really tap into that long-tailed small carriers mm -hmm. in the industry. Yeah. We've got amazing partnerships, which have helped us scale that to a level of uh, pretty sizable and meaningful. Uh, and we cater to all of the shippers uh, that need trailer pools to operate their business. You're talking about um, CPG companies, retailers, manufacturers. Uh, so we use a trailer pool kind of service there. And then, and then we do standard 3PL and brokerage work for, for customers um, throughout the country as well. So that's kind of our, our niche. That's what we do. Yeah. Um, we're pretty unique in that. And I'd say the only other caveats of, of freight Honda that make us really unique. Uh, we've got an advisory services group that helps small to medium sized carriers and companies. They're looking to make acquisitions or sell their company. Whoa. We, we, we are, we help them make that a possibility. We help bring that to life for them. So we, we basically represent them, help them package themselves up or we're, we're offering them uh, different companies that are wanting to sell. Uh, we bring those uh, opportunities to our buyers and, 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 and try to make deals that way as well. So that, that is an advisory services part of Freight Vaughn, which is super unique and gives us a lot of uh, great uh, connections uh, in, in the marketplace. And then lastly, we have a technology solutions group, which people hire us and we, we do bespoke projects for shippers, carriers, manufacturers, uh, we become like an extension of their IT team. And based on our wealth of experience and working within the walls of multi-billion dollar companies, we're able to really help out a lot of technology teams that need the additional assistance. So, Wow. And so being on the full truckload side, what are you seeing in terms of this? You know, we, we hear all about the, the driver shortage or we hear capacity crunch. Different markets may have different things what what's really going on and what is the reefer situation i i want you to touch on that later because i'm sure produce season whenever that happens that that affects it yeah i think on the carrier side right let's hit that first i think this is the downside of the cycle right when you see rating that's at five-year historic lows you know, some would argue that it that it helps. It does help certain segments, right? But the 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 transportation markets are roller coasters, as you well know, right? And after you've done it right for a certain amount of years, you've seen the entire roller coaster show. It doesn't take a lot. You could look at all the data analytics. It what goes up and comes down, and it's coming quicker and faster uh, and more voracious than it ever has. So in this current cycle, the rates being five year historic lows probably suits the budgets of shippers. 
they got their butts kicked on budgets and consistency or through the COVID and uh, years. And so this is kind of that down part of the cycle where they have some advantages on getting transportation at a very low cost. The, the backside of that low cost, the unfortunate or fortunate part of a, a market that moves the way transportation does is that, you know, what we're seeing already in the world and market is seeing is you're seeing starting to see a ramp up of how many small to medium sized carriers are going out of business. Right. That's just starting to happen over the last three or four months. We'll continue to raise. Um, and then the stat that a lot of people don't see, Jeff, that we see here and many other third party providers do, it's the culling down of the size of the freight that's very hard for a lot of folks to quantify, right? If someone goes out of business and that MC is no longer active, that's it. That's we, we can mark to that, right? And I can tell you how many trucks they had and what they did and now they're gone. But what's a really hard stat that really drives the market even faster as far as capacity coming out, let's say, Jeff, you had a trucking company, you had 18 trucks. Let's say you had 10 leases. Let's say you gave six of those leases back. So now you're at 18 trucks. Now you're at 12 trucks. You just cut your fleet by 33%. That stat's really hard to see, but how much did capacity enter or leave the market? Well, it left. Well, it left, yeah. It left, but right. I don't have something really tangible to ping on. So while people are really honing in on the revocations, right, the, the MC is going out of business, it's very critical and I'm, and I'm working with a couple partners now to really try to see into this kind of through that wormhole and say, what does it look like for just the culling down of the freight, right? That, that, that Jeff, Jeff transportation that went from 18 to 12 and every subsequent move down like that, that'll be a very interesting trend line to see because that also builds up to the capacity leaving the marketplace. And then what goes down, what must come up? And hence, we won't be running at the five-year, you know, historic lows for a long time, because as that comes out, you're going to see a normalization and, and the rates come back to more uh, normal, sustainable levels. Because at these levels, for tracking companies, I'll be honest, most tracking companies can't sustain at the levels and pricing that exists in the marketplace today. That's, I think that's factual, especially as you get into the smaller fleets. Uh, so at the rate levels of today, they're too low to, to have a, a meaningful, sustainable business. I would, I would say so. I think the market would say so. Uh, there's plenty of reasons, you know, if we, if we had more time to unpack it, but I mean, everything that people talk about, fuel prices are still high. Insurance and, and claims are still at a very high, high level. Driver pay and wages have not come down so that, you know, these owners and these people that are managing these carriers they just don't have a lot of ability to cut any of those costs out. And the equipment is still not cheap. So you add those four amongst many others, you just get to a breaking point where the economics don't work. And hence you're running a deficit every single month on cash flow and profitability. And the unfortunate part about the business is just like humans, when times are good, a lot of people don't do a good job of saving. So then when you get to these times, did you save all your money from the good times so that you can withstand it? But if you've spent that money or you got too far out over your skis, which a lot of people do, then this time is going to cause a lot of pain and, and some tough decisions have to get made on shrinking a company or uh, in the worst scenario, going out of business altogether. Ooh. All right. Give me some good news, Shannon. <laughs> the good news is the good news is that it is a market that always changes. The good news is that there are really good companies with cool technologies or cool platforms uh, or unique propositions that they're looking to bring to market. And as the market swings back, like, like many you've heard this and read this, like great companies are built and born out of some of these challenging times. And uh, obviously I'm here with you today and you know, we've started Freight Bond and we're trying to be one of those companies, Yeah, uh, but we're very humble and hungry in our approach. And so we are doing everything we can to position ourselves for the long haul. Right. Yeah, Not to yeah. be cheeky, but like those companies that are able to build sustainable growth models on the backs of good culture um, that the industry participants identify and believe in, those will be your winners. And, and we're definitely working our, our butts off, Jeff, to, to try to be one of those folks. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I like that, you know, and I, too, started, you know, a, a company in this time. And it's, you know, I tell my wife, if we can get through 2023. It's going to be very good. Right. Like, cause Q3, Q4 is when I kind of see some, some trend upwards and then really next year, 
we should we should see some normalization there. But um, hopefully, not everybody blew their wad last year because it was insanity. You know, if you were running a trucking company, uh, you really had the pick of your litter of what loads you wanted to take, and and at what price. Right. That's my point, right? You could choose what you wanted to take. And it was the time to be a driver. You know, if, if I was a driver, if I was an owner operator, um, I, I would, I would have chosen last year to do be my last year in business and, <laughs> and then hang it up. But, um, so certainly I agree with all of that. Right. And, um, and if they can ride out 2023, it's probably going to be a very, good afterwards and, and more stable because I look at the large companies, the large institutions, to your point, I understand JB hunt is procuring a lot of commercial real estate throughout the country and for the near future, because they see a large rebound in Q3, Q4. Yeah. And they want to be ready. They don't want to be caught flat footed. Yeah, and they have the benefit of that size, and they have the dry powder, and they've got the they, free cash flow. Exactly, and, you right? Know, they they're, they're not worried about necessarily. I mean, they are worried, right? Because it's publicly traded, so and you, it, you you do play the quarter over quarter game like everybody has to. But you know, they've been a company that can see beyond the uh, the ninety day uh, road show, let's call it, and they're believing in a different future. And you're going to see a lot of companies that have the have the capital go out and make some big acquisitions in this space. Um, and it's, you probably don't need to look too far from some of the companies that even during the high market times, Jeff, still weren't wildly successful, which would then tell you, hey, if, to your point, if you're not wildly successful in the, in, the, in the high market cycles, you've got almost no chance to make it through on the downside. And so you're going to see some of those companies either get folded in, acquired. Uh, you're going to see a lot of that in the industry. And, and some of those big players, like the one you mentioned, will, will probably be there for the acquisitions of both land of businesses mm -hmm. uh, and all because they want to come out and they have a, 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 a responsibility to their shareholders to figure out a way to grow and pure organic growth is really hard in this industry and so you're going to see a lot of more folks lean into the acquisition side that that have the wherewithal and capital to do so in which case your advisory business would be highly successful look at you plug in the brand Jeff. i mean you helping you out man Side marketing and sales. You, you've got. Well, I, I, I can appreciate. I mean, I can see how, you know, it's kind of an additional business unit and it has some value, especially right now when there's going to be some potential MA activity. Um, the one other th caveat that I'd ask, add to what you just mentioned, right? Those big institutions, they have very smart economists there, right? So they likely are reading the charts that we just see and it's kind of neat to look at, but they're studying all the charts and and I just look at it as they have a fully staffed finance team and economics team uh something that you and I don't have the benefit of having yet yeah yeah I mean I I've, I've seen within seen that seen seen the inside of that onion and they do have more resources I wouldn't you know I think there's incredibly talented people that uh see the world. I love, I love their follows. I love what they bring to the industry. They just, they don't have the, I would say wherewithal, they don't have the capital to really act upon some of it. And so these folks have the, the, the benefit of having a little bit of both. Yeah. So awesome. Uh, Shannon, if anybody wants to get in touch with you for using freight Vana, talk to you about your yeah. advisory services, where can they get in touch with you? What's the best way? Yeah, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, right? And that's funny yeah. how we connected, Jeff, months ago. Um, so, you know, Shannon Breen, B-R-E-E-N. Uh, we have a website that we're, we're doing some work on, but we have a website up now, hello at freightvana.io. Um, all the links, if you want to send us uh, an email to that address I just gave, go to freightvana.io. We got jobs. We've got a little bit about our company. Uh, we can all be reached either LinkedIn or the email. Um or the website, Jeff. So we'd, we'd love to hear from anybody. We, we are definitely students of the game. Uh, I mentioned, you know, being humble and hungry in our approach and we just love the connections and the new opportunities that lie ahead. Honestly, like that's what, that's what gets me out of the bed in the morning and this team. And it's a pretty special journey that we're on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Shannon, thanks so much. And uh, let's stay in touch, man. Let's, let's be on LinkedIn and we will uh, I'm sure 
be in touch in the business. All right, Jeff. Appreciate you reaching out, man. This was a lot of fun. Awesome.